Take it away. Uh, so if there's a, a, a spoiler to this session, I think it's that sometimes bold is old. Uh, in this case, uh, I think you'll hear a story of something, a muscle that this country had. It worked pretty well and uh, it lost its way. Uh, so let's begin at the beginning. Sabil, uh, when was the idea of antitrust formed in this country? And, and tell us a little bit about what that political landscape looked like. Yeah, great. So uh, the, the, the oldness to this boldness is actually really true. And in a lot of ways, this idea of uh, the need for restraints on concentrated private power as a, as a central feature of what a democracy requires goes all the way back to the origins of our debates about freedom and democracy in our constitutional order. So uh, I want to take you all back over 100 years to the late 19th century, early 20th century in the era of the first Gilded Age. And in a lot of ways, very similar to the kinds of structural debates we're having now, this is a time where uh, industrialization was producing huge new forms of inequality, new uh, mega corporations of the time. This is back when J.P. Morgan was a man and not a firm, but just as scary then as it is now. Uh, and this was the period where you started to see a really rich debate about how can a democracy survive when there are people at the top, corporations that have such outsized wealth, power, and influence, not just on the political process, right? We're used to thinking about campaign finance reform, and the early campaign finance reform uh, policies also came out of this period. Uh, but the debate then was much broader because the concern was that, well, if you have so much concentration, you also have the same kind of control over markets, over who can ship, your, who, who can ship goods through the railroads to actually get their stuff uh, uh, to market in the first place. And that was a kind of economic power that at the time was likened to the same monarchical power of King George that we fought a revolution against. And the equation really was that you couldn't have freedom without both economic freedom and political freedom. They're really closely related. And so out of that milieu came policies like antitrust, uh, the first round of public provision of uh, goods like we heard about in the last session, uh, and then uh, regulations like public utility regulations, which we'll talk more about. But really, it was a wide toolkit responding to this core idea of economic freedom. So obviously, something changed. Uh, what broke and why? So this is where I think all of us who are interested in a more inclusive economy have to do a bit of self-reflection. Because uh, I would argue that what changed really was that progressives lost that language of economic power. So if you follow the trajectory from the, the early 20th century to the present, really two big changes happened. First, you have the New Deal, which in a lot of ways you know, put a lot of these ideas into action, for, uh, a lot of new policies that create a more equitable economy. Now, there are obviously huge asterisks here, right, which we should get back to about uh, who was considered as part of the economy, right? This was uh, still a highly racialized and gendered sense of economic inclusion. Uh, but the New Deal put some of these economic uh, antitrust ideas in, into practice, but it started over time to become much more top-down, number one, much more technocratically driven by policymakers in, the, in federal agencies, and then number two, over time, started to become uh, sterilized of its moral and political content. So as you get into this, the 70s and onward, the story of economic policy and antitrust shifts from being one about liberty and freedom against economic power to one that is more narrowly focused on growth and consumer welfare. And when you make that move, then, well, as long as it's cheap, it's all good. But of course, that the concerns for progressives in the early 1900s was much broader than that. So it really is a loss of progressive ideas uh, in response to really in, uh, as, a, as a retreat from the attacks from the right against big government, against government regulation, and the valorization of corporations and, and free markets. So um, we like to blame the right a lot, and, and that's all true. But this is an instance where we also really uh, abandoned ourselves as progressives this really deep, rich tradition. Uh, so, Lena, the current moment that antitrust is having, I think, uh, really, whether it's, it's causal or uh, <laughs> correlation, <laughs> I, I leave to, to all of us to decide, but it, it uh, certainly coincided with the, the piece that you wrote on Amazon in the Yale Law Journal that really kicked off a revival of, of how we should think about antitrust. Um, at, but at the same time, you're meeting people at a moment where, as Sabil said, getting a whole lot of pretty cheap stuff on Amazon doesn't cost a lot to open a Facebook account last time I checked. So uh, 
what's wrong? What's so bad with free? Uh, why, why, is, why is consumer welfare as measured by price when prices are pretty low such a bad thing? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. And I think you know, one reason why I chose to focus on Amazon, but also digital technologies more generally, is because I think they are a particularly elegant example of why this consumer welfare approach actually renders us quite blind to the many harms that stem from market power. I think in the case of Facebook and Google, it's also important to note that these services are ostensibly free, but we're all actually playing with our data, right? So this is a form of currency, and I think antitrust still has to catch up with what you do about this form of market power, where you can coerce people into basically surrendering data. Um, I think with Amazon, you know, it's a really fascinating company. Most of us engage with it as a retailer, but it's really a form of infrastructure. Um, Amazon's online market now captures 50% of all online commerce, with that share growing faster than online commerce as a whole. Um, I think around two-thirds of American households are now Prime members. Once you become a Prime member, I think statistics show that like 90% stop really engaging in price comparison, so there's a pretty significant lock-in. Um, Amazon is also the biggest provider of cloud computing. Um, it had huge contracts with the government, is on the cusp of receiving another big contract with the Defense Department. Um, and then it also has like a huge physical logistics network so that more and more merchants are effectively dependent on Amazon. And I think you see with Amazon um, the ways in which it's able to leverage its power in one market to benefit itself in another market, which again, as both of you have mentioned, is, is not a new dynamic, right? This is something that we've seen in the past with other forms of infrastructure. What does make Amazon and these dig digital forms of infrastructure new, though, is the, just the radical amount of data and information that they collect. And I think that kind of supercharges them as monopolies, both in terms of how quickly these markets tip and how quickly they're able to concentrate power, and then also in terms of how they're able to use that power against merchants, against consumers, um, against other trading partners. And so I think you know, our, our monopoly problem is not by no means limited to just the digital markets. I mean, this is something that we see in airlines and banks and rental cars and mattress manufacturing. I mean, just across the board, I think we're beginning to reckon with the fact that excessive concentration is now a systematic feature of our political economy, not an isolated one. But again, I think the digital markets are ones where we're seeing some of these dynamics um, play out most starkly both because of how much information they have and because they're coming to mediate just growing and growing shares of our commerce and communications. Right, right. In fact, uh, you, you talk in the piece about how uh, these platforms often render um, the kind of Chicago school of thinking and uh, sort of the antitrust that we've been living in for the last 50 years sort of wrong on its own terms uh, by making things like predatory pricing actually quite a rational strategy if you're Uber and it just, it, you know, market share uh, is, is the whole game. Can you, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, so I mean the kind of revolution that Sabil was describing was partly um, executed through just introducing into antitrust a whole set of assumptions about how the economy works, right? So these are very neoclassical assumptions about markets um, really being these forms of like metaphysical forces that were likely to self-correct. Um, and as part of that set of assumptions, um, there was this idea that predatory pricing, um, which is when a company is able to price its goods below cost as a way to drive out competitors and capture the market and then use that monopoly power, that that as a strategy was just totally irrational. Um, so this was introduced by some antitrust academics and it ended up getting picked up by the Supreme Court. And so they introduced into jurisprudence the idea that this is a strategy that is just so unlikely to occur because it's so irrational that we should introduce this very, very high test for proving it. Um, and so it's basically just gutted enforcement of, of predatory pricing. Um, and I think what's interesting about these tech markets is that they are winner take all. And so it's actually very rational to price below cost to try and drive out your rivals to capture the market because that means the market tips and because there are entry barriers, it's just more difficult for competitors to enter then. And so they're just, um, again, an interesting example of how this assumption is totally unfounded. Um, I think this is just one of, of many assumptions that really undergird antitrust. Um, and I think that's what's especially interesting about the current moment, right? We've been kind of living in this like 40 year natural experiment when we just like flip the switch. And I think the political economy that we're living in today is actually in good part a reflection of that. And a lot of the you know, empirical work that's helped shift the debate is actually coming from within economics, right? And I think that's what's really fascinating is that traditionally 
antitrust and competition issues have been within the purview of industrial organization economists. And in the last few years, we've seen more and more labor economists, uh, public finance economists, macroeconomists, they're starting to look at this problem and say, hey, something doesn't add up, right? It seems like these markets are like truly broken and truly uncompetitive. And so there's a really, I think, fertile debate happening in the economics community that's really grappling with the evidence. And I think that's really what's helped catalyze the debate in the last few years is that it's just becoming like irrefutable that we have a monopoly problem and that's what's leading people to question these tenets. So let's chase that down a little bit more. Uh, you referenced this boomlet of empirical work uh, that are pointing out the number of different strands that this problem has created uh, across our economy and I think our small democracy. Uh, so what are the kind of insidious effects of the costs that we're seeing on things like uh, you know, labor markets and wages, uh, the kind of macroeconomic picture, as well as maybe Sibyl, you want to take the political costs? Um, yeah. You want to start? Yeah, go ahead. Sure, so um, one of the dimensions that's been studied, um, including by the Roosevelt Institute, is th this idea of um, labor market power. So there have been studies showing that labor markets across the country are actually quite concentrated, and as um, concentration goes up, wages go down. And so that you know, intuitively makes sense. If you have fewer employers to choose from, you have less bargaining power. And there have been a few antitrust cases where we've actually seen employers collude and agree not to poach each other's workers. And so I think the effects of concentration on labor is, is quite real. Um, we're also seeing, I think, a 40-year low in terms of uh, formation of new businesses and entrepreneurship. So the idea that in some ways these markets seem to have become so closed that we're no longer seeing new firms um, start um, also seems to correlate with this, with this larger phenomenon. I think there's some, also some start studies that are suggesting that growing concentration has contributed to inequality, both on the labor front, but also because who benefits from monopoly rents? It's shareholders, and disproportionately shareholders are the very wealthy. So you really see an upwards wealth transfer. I think there are also some more interesting kind of like system-wide effects around uh, resiliency, around national security, right? The idea that as you concentrate production, you also mm -hmm. concentrate risk. And so when Hurricane Maria hit last year, we ended up seeing a shortage in the U.S. of IV saline bags, right? So this mm -hmm. is salt water, basically, wow. which is a critical medical supply. And it was basically because we had entirely outsourced this to this one island. And so there are just all these dimensions of this problem that I think we're just coming to terms with. Um, as well as some of the, the political effects. Yeah, just, just to add to that a little bit, I think um, you know, one of the things, as, as Lena's describing, sort of the many different markets in which this is happening, right? It's not just a, a tech problem. This is actually what's, if you peer under the hood of really any sector in our economy, right? Um, that this is really what's going on. And so if we're serious about any type of real economic equity, if we're serious about closing the racial wealth gap, if we're serious about um, actually achieving the kind of balanced economy, the likes of which we actually haven't really ever fully had, we have to get at these underlying causes and drivers of the structural inequalities. And so that means tackling things like concentration in pharmaceuticals production, as Lena was mentioning, or in, uh, in labor markets. In any, really, in any one of these areas, there's you, you dig deep enough and you'll find that you know, hidden behind many layers of shell companies and mergers and uh, uh, corporate transactions, it's, it's all concentration really across the board. And, and to your point about the political effects, uh, Jen, what's, I think we're comfortable with the idea that corporate power can buy political influence through the campaign finance channel. And that's very much a part of this, right? It's not a coincidence that the tech firms have radically increased their uh, lobbying presence in Washington over the last couple of years. Uh, but there's also a way in which these, uh, this kind of hidden concentration is a gutting of our democracy in a more insidious way, which is that even if you change who's elected into office, if you don't change this type of concentrated economic power, it turns out government doesn't even control the levers of the economy, right? Because we're still at the mercy of predatory lenders who control our flows of finance, of uh, pharmaceutical companies that control whether or not they're even going to produce the drug, even if they, even if we have uh, the technology to do it, right? And so this is the this is the old progressive critique: is that we are uh, uh, essentially uh, subjects of economic corporate overlords that, and we need a, a declaration of independence against that type of power as well as the kind of classic political power. So maybe uh, pivoting now to the range of, of what we could do about all this. Um, Lena, you are in week two, I think, mm -hmm. of uh, a new gig uh, working in Congress. Are the laws that we have on the books sufficient? <laughs> 
Is this a really an enforcement issue rather than a, a matter of bold new fill in the blank? Yeah, I should note I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not on behalf of the subcommittee. I think it's both. I mean, I think it's certainly true that there are areas of the law that the courts have completely gutted, um, including predatory pricing, where we've just seen enforcement drop because it's just basically impossible to bring a case. I think there are, though, significant areas of the law where we're just seeing dramatic under-enforcement. Um, this is especially true in merger enforcement, but it's also true in monopolization. I mean, we haven't had a monopolization, serious monopolization case for 20 years at the very moment where we're living through like heightened levels of monopolization through our economy. So there's a real disjunction between um, you know, just what we're living through and what enforcers are responding to. Um, and I think this really reflects like a deeper shift in among the antitrust agencies that have really been affected by this notion of what the purpose of the antitrust laws are, because there are actually areas of the law where there's still pretty good Supreme Court precedent on the books, mm -hmm. and yet you see that even when the government brings a case, they oftentimes are like tying one hand behind their back, and you're just like, there are actually strong arguments on the table, why are you not making them? Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is gonna be um, a challenge for Congress in terms of doing strong oversight um, and ensuring that enforcers recognize the scope of the problem and are acting appropriately. Um, that said, you know, there are areas of the law um, where, yeah, I think we should expect to see um, new legislation, ideally. Um, and I think a good part of this is that it's not just that the substantive law has changed, but I think also the institutional structure of antitrust has been warped. So when Congress, you know, decided the antitrust laws, they intended for not just courts to offer substantive antitrust right. rules, but also for the FTC to play the role of this administrative tribunal where they would also be engaging in basically rulemaking um, as, as a really an expert agency that was complementing the courts. And for various reasons, the FTC hasn't played that role, and so we've just completely surrendered our antitrust laws to the courts, which of course have gone dramatically conservative and very hostile to antitrust. And so I think partly it's gonna be you know, refixing this institutional structure to ensure that we have like a robust FTC that's doing what it's supposed to do. I think the other part of the institutional element is just private enforcement. So not only can private parties bring antitrust cases, but there are treble damages attached mm -hmm. to succeeding, right? So Congress really infused the institutional structure with the, the suspicion of concentrated power, right? We didn't want to be exclusively dependent on government to be the vessel of strong antitrust. And again, that's something that has become very difficult to do, not just in antitrust, but the courts have significantly raised um, the hurdles for actually succeeding on an antitrust case. And so I think both you know, substantively and institutionally, we really need um, some changes at the level of law. And when it comes to, to change, the US isn't always uh, great at looking outside itself for, for possible solutions. But uh, what does is, what is this area of law and regulation look like in, in other places? Uh, Europe, for instance, it seems like they're also having a pretty lively debate about antitrust, uh, but uh, perhaps getting off the ground a little quicker because of, of different ways of, of approaching the issue. Yeah, I mean, Europe is really um, on the cutting edge on some of these issues, especially around digital markets. I mean, I think they've just had a much more sophisticated understanding and have been less influenced by um, this kind of neoclassical sense of how markets work. Um, I think in Europe, you know, where they've been good so far is, in is with opening investigations. I think we're still waiting to see whether the remedies that come out of that are strong. Um, but, you know, the antitrust authorities in India have been taking a strong stance. They introduced this um, pretty significant rule uh, earlier this year where they'd basically be breaking up Amazon, um, and very similar to the proposal that Senator Warren introduced. Um, so I think in, in many ways, you know, it's, it's sad the U.S. basically introduced antitrust laws, and now the U.S. is, I think, pretty significantly like the backwater of antitrust. Yeah, and this is where I think the, the history can be informative, not just as history, but also as policy. So if you, when you go back to the origins of our antitrust laws, really you saw three different tools that reformers from a century ago put on the table. One is actually just breaking up concentrations of bigness, right? And so this is uh, what Lena was talking about a moment ago. You know, think of like if you're, if you're Amazon, you can't both run the marketplace and produce the goods that sell on the marketplace, right? There's an obvious conflict of interest there. Um, if you have only two pharmaceutical producers, uh, they're not going to kind of uh, step on one another's toes to compete each other with to get the prices down. So there's just a breaking up of concentration. Uh, but there are also two other really important uh, mechanisms that we came up with and that we can bring back and we're starting to bring back. 
Uh, one is the outright public provision. So we heard about this in the last panel, that some goods are just ones that are so important and uh, so essential that they should be directly provided in a, for the, in a universal way for the public. Uh, then there's sort of a hybrid middle option, uh, which we can think of as common carriage or public utility regulation, goods that are uh, necessary for everybody. We want to keep them uh, available to, to all. But rather than having them being produced and provided by the state, we just have very tight constraints on the private firms that, that provide the good and require them to uh, comply with rules like non-discrimination requirements. So here, think about railroads, transit, net neutrality, right? That you would still have private firms running these operations, uh, but under really tight oversight from the federal government. And that requires a degree of like actual oversight, uh, which we've tended to not do of late. Uh, but we have a pretty wide toolkit in our own backyard. And I think part of what, the, uh, as Lena's alluding to, you know, um, Europe has kind of come out ahead on some of these concentration questions. I don't think they've sort of fleshed out the full set of remedies, right? And so bringing back some of these different options is going to be important in the next couple of years. Um, you know, so you've obviously, uh, you know, in some ways, kickstarted an, an academic debate, uh, and you know, in, in uh, talking in the green room uh, in the back, um, you know, one of my big questions for you was, you know, what do you think's next in that academic debate? But it sounded like you thought maybe the academy was not where the, the next few dominoes would, would fall. Um, say a little more and where yeah. you think this is headed and what it needs. I mean, I think what's been most significant in the last few years in the academic world is that certain ideas that were just not contestable, that are that were even taboo to question, have suddenly like ruptured open. Like there's a sense of contestability again in the antitrust world that I think is really exciting. Um, and I think, you know, it, there are actual like real intellectual questions that I think still need to be worked out, right? So when thinking through what a new antitrust regime would look like, I think there are just hard questions around, you know, how do you create standards for assessing conduct and that sort of thing. And so I hope that discussion will continue in the antitrust world. Um, but as we were talking about earlier, I think what's been more significant was just been just the dramatic change in public opinion and the p growing public recognition that there is a huge monopoly problem. I mean, I think, you know, one of the most significant shifts um, over the last century as part of what Sabil was describing was that antitrust and anti-monopoly went from being, you know, the key issue in the 1912 presidential campaign to being relegated to, you know, arcane antitrust law conferences. And I think reintroducing the ways in which antitrust is fundamentally about how we structure private power and all of the ways in which that affects people li people's lives and all of the ways in which if you don't if you allow it to concentrate then it starts to govern our lives i think that's the kind of thing that is just now much more infused um, throughout and i think this presidential campaign is going to be an interesting site of that continued debate and, and discussion. I think another significant shift is Congress becoming interested in these issues again. Um, I mean, I think what was quite radical about this revolution was that it totally bypassed Congress, right? So it was the executive and the courts that basically introduced this dramatically new interpretation of antitrust that ended up effectively gutting it. Um, and Congress didn't, hasn't really had a say I think the last significant antitrust statute they passed was in the 1970s. And so the fact that you're hearing increasingly from actually both, both sides of the aisle that there seems to be a problem, we need new antitrust laws, I think is, is going to be significant. Um, you know, each, each significant antitrust law that we have in the books was preceded by huge hearings, right? So there were like study, there was, there's like the study of monopoly power. There was a whole commission on economic concentration where Congress was basically just in, inviting executives from like across the economy to come and explain like how markets were working. They were studying, you know, the aluminum industry, like the bottle industry, the glass industry. I mean, it was just a whole kind of ground up understanding of like what are the problems in our economy. And I think Congress needs to go through that relearning again. And I hope that they're in the beginning of doing that. Uh, just to add, it's, it's a great example uh, in, the, in the congressional context about just how new ideas about what a just inclusive economy look like can become real. And so we're at, we're at this moment where, yes, we're talking about these debates. And in some ways, the next step is exactly channeling those ideas into the levers of policymaking. And so Lena described Congress. I think the next, the, uh, in addition to Congress, right, thinking about how we ramp up oversight from federal agencies, but also state agencies, right, under 
classic antitrust law, state attorneys general have a lot of authority on these types of issues as well. And so part of what, the inflection point we're at now, in my view, is uh, kind of converting these ideas into some of these next stage uh, policy actions. And the and, uh, last thing I'll add on that is that you know, we, we think about economics and markets as like this thing out, it's like the weather, right? It's this thing out there that there, a storm happens, right? And then we respond to it as best we can. But you know, the real story of antitrust is a way of reminding us that actually our markets and our economic systems are built by the policies we put in place. And so it feels like a market of inequality right now, but that's because of the policy changes that happened 40 years ago. And so this is all very much within our control. The levers are actually very much there. And we're now at this great, exciting inflection point where you know, folks like Lena are moving into policymaking, which is fantastic. And a lot of folks uh, here in this town are starting to ask these questions. So I think we need to really keep pushing to make sure that this interest then is followed up by actual action. Yeah, it's funny. I uh, was at the State Department many years ago and uh, worked on, among other issues, how we could shore up American competitiveness from Chinese state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. and was shocked and delighted to learn that we actually have on the books international criminal antitrust uh, statutes. Uh, and I called up my friends at the Justice Department and said, hey, uh, why don't you look at some of these Chinese cartels that are cornering markets and, and dumping in, in US markets? And uh, said, oh, we don't do that anymore. OPEC, basically. We have foreign policy concerns with it. I said, I'm the State Department. I guarantee go forth and prosecute. And it was just not done, uh, yeah. to your point. Absolutely. I mean, the Sherman Act is also a criminal statute. I mean, monopolization is supposed to be a crime, right? right. And so I think that's even domestically we see Absolutely. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe uh, last question to you both, you know, as hopefully has come out thus far, we're having a bit of a moment with antitrust, uh, looking at everything from uh, reigning in uh, big tech in Silicon Valley to the, the work that I, I, I saw just today, I think, um, Open Markets is doing around concentrated uh, sort of power within agricultural markets in the middle of this country. Uh, the issue seems uh, really to touch shore to shore, red, blue, otherwise. Um, so how do, we, how do we capitalize on the moment that we have? If you had to kind of give us one or two steps that you feel like are, are most crucial that we take in the near term. What does that look like? I mean, I think one continuing challenge is to just translate for people what antitrust is and what it means. And I think this is um, a really, I think journalism has a really important role to play here. And I think you know, one huge contribution from open markets is that they tell these stories um, about people's lives and all the ways in which monopoly power is affecting people. Um, because, you know, in Congress, what members want to hear is like, how do I go home and campaign on this, right? How do I tell people why this matters? And I think in many ways, it's just a question of translating the problems that we're seeing and sh showing how is to be able to saying, like, if you peel back, so many of these problems are actually monopoly problems, right? So like skyrocketing healthcare costs, for example, like so much of that is just due to consolidation throughout the supply chain. And so I think continuing to do that work of translation and explaining to people why this is so critical um, is gonna be an important factor. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. I think, you know, uh, this all goes into this, this conversation we were having just a moment ago about how we convert these big ideas and aspirations into, into change in this current moment. And so um, I think the public narrative is a big part of it for sure. Um, you know, at, at Demos, a lot of the work that we do is linking up ideas with social movements and connecting that to policy. And so, you know, what I would add to this, I think, is uh, two other vectors. One is that uh, linking up these critiques with what we're seeing on the ground from a lot of exciting social movements that are thinking about these deep structural questions, right, about linking up economic power with questions of racial discrimination, questions of economic inequality uh, on the ground in, in these many different states and communities, right? And using that to sort of drive the conversation uh, to open up these debates. But then it's a one-two punch because then you also need to have the policy ideas uh, in place so that you know, that next wave of enforcers, right. of uh, uh, administrative officials at, at the state and at the federal level um, know what to move on. And so we have this kind of window right now, which is very exciting, but also I think we're all keenly aware that it could be quite brief and we sort of need to make the most of it. And so right now is when we really should be, you know, the title of this conference, right? This is now is the time to be as bold as possible uh, to try to lock some of these ideas in so that, you know, come two years from now, we're actually looking back and saying, okay, we have a, we've actually moved to a very different 
way of governing the economy, and that will be good for, for a lot of us going forward. I feel uh, much better knowing that this is a conversation that is in uh, the two of your hands, uh, as well as many others in this room today, and uh, thank you for all that you've done to get us where we are. Thank you.